everyone. Welcome to the first episode of CS350 Online, at least for the fall term. I'm your host, Leslie, and on today's episode, we're going to do some introductions. We'll talk about how the version of this course is going to run this term, which will actually be very similar to last term. And once we're done with all that boring administrative stuff, then we'll actually jump into our first topic, which is the three different views that we have for an operating system. And just in general, what is an operating system? So let's talk for a minute. So many of you may have seen me around the university for a while, and maybe some of you haven't. My name is Leslie Eisted. I am a lecturer and a researcher here at the University of Waterloo. And I have actually been here for almost 20 years now because I actually did my undergrad, master's, and PhD at Waterloo, and now I work here. So this course, CS350, I did actually take it 17 years ago? I don't remember. It's a long time ago. Uh, was it different than it is now? Yes, it was a slightly different course. Uh, for one, we did group work, and you guys don't have group work. The operating system we were working on was different. It was called Nachos, and you guys are working on OS 161. Uh, but the concepts were still the same. Now, I said I was also a researcher. My research topics, for those of you that might be interested, are stereoscopic 3D and film production pipelines. So I focus mostly on computer graphics, but I do a bit of machine learning. I do some natural language processing. And, you know, it's interesting because sometimes it actually overlaps with networking and operating systems as well, doing things like real-time collaborative editing and content management systems and security. So it's kind of a fun topic to be in. Now, a couple other interesting things. So, as I said, I'm not, I'm obviously a graphics person. Why am I always teaching the operating systems course? Well, because I wanted to. <laughs> True story. Um, but I also do have a fair bit of experience with low-level systems work outside of just my experience through film. And that is through working at places like Sun Microsystems, which maybe you haven't heard of because they're long dead now. Um, but I've also done a lot of compiler development as well. And in particular, something I've done that will come into play later in the term is device driver development. Uh, I have made many, many printer drivers in my life. So, wherever you are, I hope that you're staying safe and healthy. And if you're back here in Waterloo, welcome back. And if you've decided to stay home, hey, I can't blame you. It's probably cheaper uh, than coming here. And I hope you're not going too stir crazy. I know it's been, what, six months of this social distancing, and that can probably wear on many of you quite a bit. And one of the things that I'm really going to miss about this term, and I really missed it about last term as well, was the fact that I don't actually get to meet any of you face to face. I have no idea what any of you look like. We won't get to talk before class. You won't get to come into off my office and, and just chat. And that's kind of sad. So I started a thread on Piazza, and I welcome you to add yourself to it, just to introduce yourself to your fellow classmates so I can learn something maybe about you. And if you're really, really brave, make a 10 to 30 second video just introducing yourself and i think i said on september 15th i'll collect up any videos that get sent to me send them to my email and i'll release just privately to the class a video where you can introduce yourself um you don't have to do it i just thought it might be fun um because why not right all right so this course's term, as it was last term, is going to be run completely online, so you will have no in-person components whatsoever. And we are doing our best to make sure that this is being offered asynchronously, as the university desired. But also, we want to make sure that this course isn't going to stress you out too much. So here is how things are going to run. So first off, this kind of goes against the asynchronous requirements of the university, but I'll explain while we're doing it. We are going to have live streamed lecture episodes every Tuesday and Thursday at 9.30 in the morning. I know that's very early in the morning. I have two children. They are two and six years old. It's just the time slot that works out because we are homeschooling our kids this, this year. Um, 
Now, you have, I'm not under any expectations that you attend the live stream. You don't have to attend the live stream. It is merely here for those of you who are missing that regularly scheduled lecture content. We wanted you to have something for you to be able to build a schedule around, something to look forward to during the week. And so I've decided to redo each term the lectures in a formal set. For those of you who don't want to wait for the fresh episode to air and you want to just work ahead, you do have that option as well. And I'm going to actually switch over here to my computer. If you go on YouTube and the link to this is actually posted um, on Piazza, our YouTube channel actually has playlists for all of our previous recorded lectures. So we've got the spring of 2020, all of the episodes are there. And we also have fall of 2019. Now you might be a little confused as to why we have fall of 2019 as well. That's actually because we ran into a little bit of an attendance problem and um, students became a fire hazard in the room. So in order to keep attendance down, we started live streaming the actual lectures that were in person. Now, we didn't actually get permission to do that until um, about six lectures into the term. So you'll see that we have lectures 6 to 24 from the fall of 2019. So all of our content is already online for anyone who wants to work ahead. So if you want to truly do this asynchronously, you're totally welcome to. And if you want to do fresh episodes where you get them dropped twice a week, then you're welcome to do that as well. It's really up to you what you want to do. Now, one of the advantages I um, will say about... Um, doing watching the live stream is that I actually have Twitch open here on another computer and I am monitoring your the, the chat. So if you do want to ask a question live, you can do so during the live stream episodes. So that's an advantage of doing that. But it's totally up to you. We don't we don't care what you do really. Uh, all right. Losing my mouse here. I've got way too many computer monitors attached to this machine. All right, so that's how you're going to get your lecture content. In addition to that, we have the course's slides, which are all posted on our course website, and they've been updated for this term. And there is a textbook as well, but we don't really use it. It's free, it's online, read it if you want. Uh, the other thing I want to say is about office hours. So due to scheduling and working from home, it can be really difficult for some of us to actually have regularly scheduled office hours. So I've, in particular, that's quite tricky for me. So if you'd like to meet with me, I'll be doing office hours by appointment and then we can choose a tool that we both have. So we can use Zoom, uh, we can use FaceTime or Google Hangouts. There's different options that I'm open to for office hours by appointments. Huma will be doing regularly scheduled office hours and our wonderful IAs, uh, Emil and Ryan, they will also be doing office hours and I think they're going to be using Discord for that. Now, for those of you who are in a country that does not legally allow you to use Twitch or YouTube, don't worry. We will also be uploading the episodes to learn, but I will say they will be of a much lower quality, and that's not our desire. That's simply the fact that Learn doesn't support large file sizes, and each of these lecture videos usually works out to be about three and a half to four gigabytes, and Learn only permits one gig files to be uploaded, so we have to actually downsample them a fair bit before we can upload them to Learn. So you have lots of uh, different ways to contact us, and of course Piazza, which will always be on Piazza. Um, and you have lots of ways to actually get the lecture content. So on that note, I apologize by the way if you hear other people talking. My kids are in the basement playing and 
Who knows what's going to happen? <laughs> um, hopefully some of you are actually excited to take this course. Um, I know traditionally most people aren't excited to take this course. And I think there has been over the last 10 years, a lot of fear over this course. And when I started teaching this course a few years back, the fear of the course really surprised me. And that was because when I took this course, I had been waiting years to take it. It's like, yeah, I finally get to take OS. Woo. So I didn't understand why people were afraid of it. And I had to slow down and think about why might people actually be afraid of it. And the reason is, you know, the world had changed a lot since I took this. So when I went to take this course, operating systems weren't at a place that they are today. I mean, for one, when was the last time you attended a Windows release party or a Mac OS release party? Or when was the last time you celebrated the new version of a Linux kernel being released? I'm going to take a wild guess and say none of you have ever done any of this. But we've been pretty excited about it. <laughs> See, operating systems in the 90s and early 2000s, they didn't really work that well. There were a lot of flaws in them. Um, so when I was in high school, we used OS2. It was to warp, actually. And we used Windows 3.1 and Windows 95. And I think we might have even used Windows 98 towards the end. I used Linux starting in about 1997, but it was only through a shell. All of those operating systems, they didn't work well. They blue screened of death all of the time. There were major flaws. And so when a new operating system came out, it was actually a pretty exciting thing. And it was also this concept of when you are using an operating system which has all of these flaws and you're interested in computing, you're thinking to yourself, I'm going to build my own operating system. I'm going to be as big as Microsoft and mine's actually going to work. So when you finally got to take this course, we were all super excited about building our own operating systems. But of course, you don't get to actually do this, do that in this course. And we didn't back then either. So sorry to disappoint anyone thinking that you're going to build an OS from scratch. Uh, if you want to build an OS from scratch, I think SE350 is a little bit closer to that, but it's a lot more work. So, I mean, there's obviously a lack of interest because operating systems today, they just kind of work. I mean, they are still quite flawed, but I don't have blue screens of death all the time. Okay, that's not completely true. <laughs> My research machine has some faulty hardware in it right now and hit blue screens of death about every five minutes. Hardware issue though, I've got to fix that. My Mac here though that I'm running this, this is the lecture stream off of, it crashes rarely. And when I mean rarely, I mean it really rarely. And then beside it, I've got an old Surface 3. And admittedly, it crashes more often, but it still doesn't crash that often. And I've got another Mac sitting over there. And I know you can't see it. And it's, it's like seven years old. And it crashes rarely. <laughs> Things work today. Your cell phones work today. All of the operating systems that we have access to today, they work pretty well. So it's easy to not be excited about the topic. Um, the other thing is that you've probably heard that this is a programming heavy course and it is a programming heavy course. Um, all of your assignments, all of them are going to be writing C code and not modern C, you're going to be writing like C89, C99 at best. Um, so no modern features. And if you've been using Python and Ajax and Ruby on Rails and all these other things in your co-op terms, you may not have as much C experience as you might need for this course. So make sure when, if, if you're one of these people who don't have a lot of C experience outside of CS136, do make sure that you read our little tutorial slides that are posted on the course website. Um, Refamiliarize yourself with C. The other problem, of course, is that if you took CS136 and you haven't used C since then, we're not using C shell. C shell is this thing that we made so you wouldn't have to learn anything about the compiler or anything like that. You could just write some C code and have it run in a web browser and it would just work. And I say work in quotes. So 
you're actually going to be using make files and GCC and GDB this term. We're not using C shell. Um, that means that memory errors, it's on you to detect them and it's on you to fix them. And unfortunately, Valgrind does not work for our operating system. And it's going to be actually quite difficult to detect and fix those memory errors. Don't worry, I have a guide to decomposing the error messages of the operating system, and I will post that to Piazza later. So do get some experience um, or refresh yourself with C because all of your assignments are going to be writing C code. And I think that is one of the reasons why people are afraid of this course, but we'll get you through it. So the other thing is that the assignments and the exams tend to be quite a bit different from each other. On the assignment, you're going to be just hashing away at some C code. And on the exams, we tend to ask more theoretical questions. And because of that gap, that tends to scare people. Now, interestingly enough, you have no midterm. Uh, we, when I was creating the online version of this course, I didn't want to have so many stressful components, like a midterm. And I didn't want you to have to like, write your type out text answers in a box and then have our TAs grade them. So no midterm but we are going to have quizzes instead and everything is automatically graded. So you're going to know how you did immediately. We'll talk more about that in a couple minutes. So there's not as much fear I feel in the online version um, than the in-person version. So you don't have to sit in the pack in, amongst a thousand other fearful people. Don't worry about that. All right. So let's actually go through some admin details. Hopefully we can get you excited about the course and, and stem some of that fear. All right, let's go back here. All right. So welcome, <laughs> I already said that. Uh, if you haven't used our course websites before, here it is. This is where you can find, of course, all the information about when our office hours are. This is where all of the assignments are posted and they are all already posted. Um, you'll also find information about extra tutorials, previous midterms, all of that stuff on the course website. Piazza is where we're going to do the most of our communication though. I have a bunch of extra content, uh, helpful guides and how to's and we're going to post all of that informal content to Piazza and we'll be answering all questions there. So do make sure that you can log into Piazza and, and, and so on. Be friendly on Piazza, please. All right, so course notes are required because that is our official print material, but the textbook is not required. We have extracted relevant readings from the completely free textbook, and we've already posted them on the course website. Whether you read them is completely up to you. I have no expectations that you have read them. For the record, when I took this course, I didn't read the textbook either. It was a different book, but I didn't read. All right, so what do we actually expect from you this term? So as normal, we have five assignments and they are named rather oddly. Um, <laughs> that's a long story. The assignments this term are the same assignments that we've had for the previous like 10 terms. Uh, we are actually in the process of changing them, but I'm taking a very slow path to changing the assignments. And the reason for that is because I didn't want to introduce new assignments with the introduction of a brand new online term. And I want to make sure that when our new assignments actually make it out there, they are top quality. Um, so new assignments are coming, but you don't have to worry about them because they're not coming this term. We are using the same assignments as the previous terms. Uh, A0, you should start that tonight and get it done immediately. It's essentially, can you download and install OS 161 and the companion tools and get it compiling? Put your name on it, add a menu feature, and you're done. It shouldn't take you very long. In fact, the thing that's going to take you the longest about assignment zero is actually going to be uh, getting it compiling and running. And I will talk more about that uh, in a few minutes. All right, then assignments one, A2A, A2B, and A3, they are traditional 
coding assignments, they will be done in C. Each assignment has a different weight, so do pay attention to that. So we have five of those assignments. Then we have, instead of a midterm and a heavily weighted final, we have quizzes. There is one quiz for each module, including this one, and the quizzes will be done on Learn. And we don't have any of the quizzes up yet. They will start to appear on Learn at the end of this week. You will have until the last day of classes to complete all of the quizzes. Now, just my own observations from last term, most people actually left the quizzes to the very end of the term and then tried to finish them all the day they were due. There's like nine of them. There'll be something like 12 to 25 questions each mostly true false some multiple choice some fill in the blank kind of things but don't save them till the end try to do them throughout the term the quizzes uh, you get two attempts at each quiz. We're going to take the maximum score. You get a lot of time to do these quizzes something like 60 or 90 minutes uh, and the reason for that is we know some of you are probably living in rural communities where you don't have great internet. Um, I grew up in one such area. Dial-up internet's making a comeback there because, well, it's more stable than the other offers. Um, so we're giving you lots of time and we're giving you a couple attempts to actually do the quizzes just in case you have interrupt disruptions or family issues you know trying to we're trying to make this relaxed you will have a final assessment that will happen during the final exam period it's worth less than the quizzes it's worth the quizzes are worth 35%. The final assessment is worth 25%. It will be just a much longer quiz. So again, administered completely through Learn. And you will get three attempts at the final assessment instead of two. And you will get something like three or four hours to, to do it each time. We will always take the highest grade. Now you will not see which questions you got right and wrong um, because obviously you're going to be getting a lot of attempts at it. So yes, you can. there's a question on Twitch here, here asking if you can access the quiz questions and answers after completing them. No, no, we won't be giving access to the um, answers after completing them because we're not setting the due date until the very end of the term. You will, however, see which ones I think that you got wrong. We just won't show you which ones were the correct answers. So you will see your score and you can decide from then whether you want to, to do the quiz again. So that's what we have. Um, again, trying to take as much stress off of you as possible. Uh, and you'll note we have amended this. You have to pass the quizzes and um, the final assessment in order to pass the course, which is standard procedure from previous terms. In my experience, uh, <laughs> people do really well on the quizzes. So I think our quiz average last term was like close to 90. We are changing the quizzes up somewhat because we want to add some fresh questions to it, but um, we do anticipate that it'll be pretty high. Are we using any kind of proctoring software to make sure that you're not cheating on quizzes or the final assessment? No, no, that that's, that's an invasion not only of your private life, that's also an invasion of your computer privacy. So we will not be using any kind of proctoring garbage um, in this course. We have other ways of trying to reduce cheating and one of the ways that we'll be using is you will all get different quizzes so you and your friend even if you are sitting side by side you will get completely different quizzes uh, there may be some question overlap but there shouldn't be a lot and yes that means it's a lot of work on us to make such a large pool of questions 
Um, now, if you're worried about things like, well, is it going to be fair um, in terms of level of difficulty, we've actually broken down the questions by difficulty and everybody gets the same number of questions from each difficulty pool. So we're trying to make it random, but also fair. All right. So as I said, there were five assignments. You have to do them by yourself. You are not writing your own operating system. You are actually going to be adding on to an existing one called OS 161, which is a BSD-like operating system. It's about 22,000 lines of code. It's actually quite small. Although I will say the one we're switching to, I think is even smaller. Uh, it is a MIPS based operating system, which means you're going to need to run it via Sys161, our simulator for MIPS. Uh, if you're sitting there in a panic, um, saying, I don't remember MIPS, don't worry. We're not asking you to write any assembly code for any of the assignments. Now we have a question here on Twitch just about the quizzes I would like to address. Someone is asking, will the questions be the same on both attempts? for a quiz. No. Uh, each time you take the quiz, it will be a different random sample. All right, now back to the assignments. So my recommendation about the assignments is to start them early. They are all posted to, PR, uh, to the course website already. It is exceedingly difficult to get OS 161 um, running on your home system. Now we have instructions for how to roughly get it running natively in Linux. And we will be posting instructions for how to get it running on something like Hi Sierra or Catalina. But getting OS 161 to run natively on your computer is very, very hard because it requires that you have GCC 4.4, 4.5, 4.6 or 4.7. And if you have any GCC that is newer than that, you probably won't get it running. I have instructions to get it running on GCC 8 and it works for some people, but it doesn't work for everybody. And there are patches that have to be made and it's, it's a bit of a pain and I will post all of that. But what I wanna say is try to get it running natively on your computer but if you've tried for a couple hours and you can't get OS 161 compiling and running natively on your own machine, stop. You could waste a week of time trying to get it to run. And because everybody's system setup is a little bit different, there's not really much we can do to help you. You have a few different options. I know on GitHub somewhere someone has a Docker image. Uh, you are welcome to use that Docker image so long as it doesn't include the actual assignment code. Um, there is also, we have an official VM posted to the course website, which one of our previous IAs made. You can download it. It's for VirtualBox, I think. And it has OS 161 and all of its companion tools installed and running already. You're welcome to use that as well. If you want to use your native thing, because I know SSHing in remotely into the school service can be a real pain in the butt, especially if you're in a, a like a rural community with bad internet. Um, the other option, of course, which is a surefire going to work is just to get it running in the school environment. And all the instructions to do that are on the course website. Do try to get that running this week and get A0 out the door because, you know, there are other assignments and you don't want to be trying to get that working uh, later on. Now, we also understand um, that shit happens. You might get sick, your internet might go down, things happen. So we have these things called slip days and you get five slip days for the entire term. You can use no more than three per assignment and essentially they let you submit your assignment late by up to however many days you want to use. There is no special thing that you need to do to make this work. So if you want to use a slip date, just submit after the deadline. That's it. We will handle docking slip days as appropriate. There will be no reduction of grades or anything like that. These are just 
lengths you can use, but up to five for the whole term and a maximum of three per assignment. Please do not use slip days on A0. That would be horribly silly. Uh, or And try your best not to use them on A1 because you're really going to want them for A2A, A2B, and A3. Now, the other thing I want to say is to encourage you not to use slip days. Um, you will receive a 0.4% bonus on your final grade for each slip day you don't use. So if you finish the course with all of your slip days intact, you get a 2% bonus on your final grade. Assuming, of course, you actually submitted all of the assignments. Um, we have that little stipulation there. Uh, now, why are we doing this? Because the grades are, have been pretty high for this course, for the online versions. The reason why I'm doing it is because what I see happen is I see students letting the previous assignment carry over into the next one. And that act, it, that's easy to happen because the assignments build on each other. We don't, okay, say, here's A1, submit it, and then when A2A comes up, we don't give you the answers to A1. Your A2A is built off your A1, and your A2B is built off your A2A, and your A3 is built off your A2B. So if you don't have the previous one working, you can't get full marks on the next assignment. So it's very tempting for people to use a lot of slip days. The problem, of course, is you spend a lot of extra time working on the previous assignment and not as much time working on the current assignment, and it ends up kind of spiraling out of control. So we put this kind of bonus out there to encourage you to do the assignments early, get it done so it doesn't get out of hand. All right, don't cheat, you know that. Um, <laughs> Now, I know some other courses might have complained about the fact that they had increased cheating. We've actually seen a decrease in cheating. Either that or you guys are getting exceptionally clever at doing it. Um, the standard procedure is we run your code through MOS. We have all of the previous assignments. We know about all of the public code on GitHub for this course. We have it. We compare your code to the code collection that we have. If we see a certain percent similarity, we take a closer look. If we think it's cheating, then we'll call you in and it will be a virtual call in. If it we do deem it cheating, it's zero on the assignment and minus 5% off your final grade. If you consider that the assignments tend to be worth 10%, that means that cheating could be 15% of your course grade gone in an instant. The other problem with cheating in this course is since the assignments are built off each other, you can't cheat on A2A and then use that as your base for A2B. We'll actually ask that you redo A2A for A2B, which is a lot of extra work and a lot of extra stress on you. So it's just not worth it. So please don't do it. Also, it's work for us. I don't want to do work. <laughs> Ah, so there's another question on uh, Twitch here. Will we get an extension if the school server is down or broken? Yes. Yes, you will. Uh, so we will monitor the, the, the situation. And if the servers are experiencing difficulties like the day the assignment is due, then we will obviously adjust the assignment. Um, it obviously, during this pandemic it takes a little bit longer for the servers to get back up and running um, because we don't have as much staff on campus as we would normally have um, but also the stu students tend to be using the servers a lot more um, so yeah we, we will take care of you don't worry we're not going to let you lose marks just because there's something wrong with the, the infrastructure all right now one other thing I want to say about assignments is please use some kind of source control. And I know it's really tempting not to. That was me when I was in undergrad. <laughs> but what you're going to find with these assignments is that you get 90% of the assignment done and working, and you've got two hours left before the deadline. So you're like, I'm going to attack that 10%. And in those two hours where you attack that remaining 10%, somehow it breaks the 90% that you already had working. And so you try to go back to what you had before and it just doesn't work. Use source control. Every time you make a change, 
push it. Now, I don't care what kind of source control you use. Git seems to be the popular thing these days. I don't like Git. I would prefer to use SVN or Perforce or Mercurial. I, I just don't like Git. Um, but Git is out there. You're welcome to use it. Just make sure that you're not making your code public because people will steal it. Um, if you want to use CVS, that's fine. If you want to use SVN, I, I don't really care. If you want to buy a new laptop every time you write a line of code, go ahead. And I know there's some of you out there that I'm sure can afford to do that considering the number of Lambos I've seen around here, but use some kind of source control. If you have questions about Git, please direct them towards our IAs, Emil and Ryan. Um, they will be better um, at helping you with Git problems. If you want to use SVN and you have questions about that, Feel free to direct those comments towards me. All right. Sorry, I wasn't making fun of people who have nice Lambos. I was simply saying there are people out there who could actually afford to buy a new laptop every three seconds. I can't. All right, one last thing about assignments. If you're in the boat where you've taken this course before and for whatever reason had to drop it or take it again, and you want, because the assignments haven't changed, you're concerned about cheating, have no fears. You're allowed to use your previous assignments here. All you have to do is inform us that you intend to use your previous assignments so that we can mark it down in the system and simply make it so that Moss doesn't count you as cheating against yourself. And I know this policy is very different from most other courses, but I, I don't care. <laughs> there we go. All right, so we're going to switch slides here, and we're going to switch topics. What we're going to talk about now is what is an operating system, because that's what this course is about. So what is an operating system? You know, if you think about an operating system, and you have a cell phone in front of you, I know these images are old, but you're probably thinking about what does it look like. So we have an old version of Android here. You've got some pretty ugly icons and a really terrible background. And here's a nice and grainy version of iOS. It's got these kind of menu systems at the bottom. And then you've got a bunch of tappy icons. Or you might be thinking about the start menu in Windows. I would certainly understand why you would think of an operating system as being the start menu and way to access programs. Here's Unity. G, um, GTK based um, window management system for, for Linux. And again, you've got kind of your access to all of the different programs and utilities. Many of you will be familiar with Mac. You've, I, I don't know what this is called. You'd think someone who's been using Mac for like seven years would know what this is called, but I don't. It's a true story. I don't like Mac. Why am I using it? Um, because you can't take a 15 pound gaming laptop running Linux onto a film set. They think you're trying to steal things and look at you very strangely. <laughs> they use Apple, so I have to use Apple. But that doesn't mean I have to like it. Anyways, when you think about using an Apple product, you're thinking about this dock thingy down at the bottom. And you're thinking about, oh, if I click on the rocket ship, which doesn't appear to be here, that will let me launch different programs and look, Here's Safari and um, the photo booth thingy that I don't use. Um, but this is what you're thinking about. You're thinking about the interface used to launch the programs that you want to use. This is one you might not be familiar with, but I certainly am. This is QNX and the Photon Desktop, which I did use for a period of time eons ago. And um, it's got a lovely start menu and it's got these shortcuts here for accessing the different programs. This is BOS and it's another kind of Unix based operating system and if you're in the CS club you can probably uh, fire up the old BBOX and run it if the BBOX even still runs. But again when you think about this operating system we're thinking about it as a tool to launch programs and we're thinking about how do I access the ability to launch those programs. This is a lovely old TWM. Isn't it pretty? It's an old Solaris install. It's not pretty, it's hideous. 
This is what I used for a long time. And then here, if we go back even further in time, this is uh, IBM PC DOS 2.0, which is something I have spent a lot of time uh, using in my life. And how we launch program series, obviously, by typing things at the terminal. The point I'm trying to make here is when we think about operating systems traditionally, we're not thinking about what an operating system is actually doing for us. We tend to think about what does it look like? How do we interact with it? How do we launch programs using that operating system? But an operating system, while part of its job is to launch programs for you, there's a lot more to it than that, obviously. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a whole course dedicated to it, right? So, what is there to an operating system? Well, what's interesting is how integrated our experience is with the OS. Things that we wouldn't usually think the operating system is involved in, it is. So obviously, if you double click on a program icon, the operating system is going to be involved because it's going to launch the program for you. Saving a file. Yeah. That's the operating systems involved there as well. If you push a key on the keyboard, you bet the OS is involved. Using malloc? Now you might be like, surely the OS isn't involved in malloc. Sometimes it is. We're going to see later how the OS is involved with malloc when we talk about virtual memory. If you want to execute an assembly instruction, the OS might be involved. Print to file, use printf. You are damn right the OS involved, is involved with those things. And over the course of this term, you are going to see just how the OS is involved in all of these different things. So what is an operating system? If you try to peg down a definition for an OS, it's actually kind of hard to peg it down because what an operating system is has really changed over time. If you go back to the very first operating systems, which were the early 1950s, um, one of the original ones was called Leo One. Um, it wasn't what you think of an OS to be today. In the early 1950s, an operating system was really just an I.O. library. And you might be wondering, what's an I.O. library? Well, an I.O. library is something that we use to write to files or interact with the keyboard. We'll talk more about it in a minute. And the OS actually evolved from there to be things like batch processors, and we keep adding and adding and adding. So when we're talking about what's the definition of an operating system, we're going to talk about it from today's standpoint, not 60, 70 years ago standpoint. So we say an operating system, it manages resources. What are resources? Well, there's hardware resources, but there's also other kinds of resources as well. Um, digital resources. And we'll talk about that. Operating systems create execution environments that we load and execute programs from. We're also going to, in our operating systems, provide common services and utilities. Things like the ability to have threads and the ability to adjust the voltage of your CPU. Now, if that's something you've never done before, you're very lucky. I have unfortunately had to do that. So we're going to start by looking at operating systems from three different standpoints. We have the application view, which is what are services that the operating system is providing to the user and providing to the user programs. Then we're going to take a brief look at what does the um, what kinds of problems is the operating system solving in the system view. And then we have this implementation view for how do we actually build the operating system so we can offer these things and solve these problems. So looking at the application view of an operating system, this is actually kind of the earliest kind of operating system view because the original operating systems, as I said, were simply I.O. libraries. If you go back in time, imagine this. Imagine you're a programmer in the 1950s and you have to like write a program in binary or very basic byte code by punching holes in a card. 
and you need to create a file on a disk. And we're not talking about like a little disk in a computer. We're talking like a refrigerator sized tape drive. You've got to write some data, store some data to that. How do you do it? Now you're probably sitting there thinking, well, what's the assembly code for calling, um, you know, F open and F write and F close, except in the 1950s, those functions didn't exist. And so each and every developer who wanted to write data to a permanent storage had to actually write 100% of the code to interface with the permanent storage, but actually figure out how to write the individual bytes to the permanent storage. And then they had to write their own way of accessing those individual bytes of permanent storage. And as I'm sure you all know, not every developer is created equally. Some developers are a bit more um, better in the design department, I'm trying to find a PC way of putting it, than others. So you've got each developer writing their own way of writing data to disk. Their code doesn't work with each other. I can't take a file written from person A and use that file in my code without getting their code to do it. So sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. And so people got this idea, maybe we should make a library function to interface with the permanent storage. And that way, instead of having our developers waste all of this time trying to write code to access permanent storage themselves, they can just call this handy dandy function and it's handled and it works. So they can focus on the actual algorithm or program they are working on. IO libraries, application, what is the operating system providing to us? So IO libraries, very first kind of OS. Now, interesting story about, um, Atari. The old um, Atari systems um, from way back in the day, there was um, no libraries provided. So if you wanted to interface with the joystick, Atari didn't give you a game development kit and say, here's the functions to interact with the joystick. And here's the functions to interact with the sound system. And here's the functions to interact with the display. So each and every single game developer had to actually develop their own tools to do this. And some companies were obviously more successful than others at doing this. But one of the worst games ever made is E.T. And it actually suffered as a result for this. And it was a twofold problem. Um, one, because there were no libraries provided by Atari to interact with the hardware. So the company had to do it themselves. And when they did it themselves, they screwed up massively and the game was impossible to control. Now it was a two part problem. Number one, their joystick driver that the company wrote didn't quite work properly, but number two, they got their collision mathematics wrong. So that was also a problem. But this, the point I'm trying to make is things like these IO libraries are absolutely critical for an operating system to implement because they're going to abstract, which is a big word for operating systems, the underlying implementation and access to the hardware such that the user programs don't have to worry about how bytes are stored on the disk. The user program can use open and write and close and it just knows they're going to work and it doesn't have to worry about it. So that's something very, very important that we're providing in the application view is things like IO libraries, interfaces, APIs. Another thing that the application view includes is the execution environment. So we are actually going to, the, as an operating system, we are providing the user program with this isolated environment to run in because we don't really want a program knowing that it's not the only program in existence. We want each program that runs to believe it is the only thing that exists in the world. And there are many reasons to do that. One of them is security. Because if you know that you are not the only program running in the world, then you can take advantage of that fact and try to find the other programs that are running. And we don't want that to happen. So we're going to create this execution environment that isolates and abstracts user programs from each other, but from the hardware itself. 
And that is a service that the operating system is providing to the user program. And we're going to talk a lot more about that over this term. Something we don't tend to talk a lot about in this course is the system view. So what are the kinds of problems that the operating system is solving? But here are some of those problems just to talk about a little bit. Your computer has a fixed number of resources. You only have so much RAM. My laptop here sadly only has 32 gigs of RAM and I can use 100% of that in a heartbeat. I only have one CPU in this computer. And it might be an i9, and it might have six cores, but that's still a fixed number of resources. I have one keyboard. Technically, I have two mice. Technically, I have two monitors. But it's still a fixed amount of resources. And if you've got all of these programs running, the operating system needs some way of sharing all of those resources between all of those programs. So the operating system is responsible for managing the hardware resources, but also for allocating those resources fairly to all of the different programs. And something that's interesting is the fact that you also need the ability to share those resources with yourself because the operating system needs some of those resources to run and manage them. Then, of course, we have the implementation view of the operating system. So how do we actually implement solutions to these problems and provide those services to the user program? There are two big topics um, in the implementation view. One of them we are not really going to be talking much about. And the other one is concurrency. So concurrency is part of the implementation view. This is how do we implement the ability to have multiple programs running at the same time. And I'm going to say at the same time or appearing to run at the same time. How do we implement that? Now, I know some of you are probably sitting there. Well, I have a core i9, I have six cores, and that means I can run 12 programs at the same time. And you might be like, oh, I've only got, you know, one Chrome open, but how many tabs do you have? And is Chrome really the only thing that's running on your computer? Because I can tell you the number of programs that are running on my computer right now, technically speaking, I've probably got 300 programs and probably about 1,800 threads, which is more than I can run truly in parallel on my hardware, which is why the implementation view is so important. We need to look at how do I let so many programs actually share those resources? What kind of algorithms do I need to give the illusion that all of those programs are running at the same time? And it is an illusion. It is an illusion because they're not all actually running at the same time. Then another part of the implementation view is talking about this concept of real time. And unfortunately, this is a really bad term in operating systems because we mean two different, there are two definitions and they're very different. So we say we have uh, operating systems should be real time. And then we have this concept called a real time OS. Well, real time in the sense that when you interact with it, the OS should respond quickly. Because if it takes five minutes for the OS to respond, I'm going to throw the computer out the window. Then there's this concept of a real-time OS. And that is something on top of that. That is adding extra constraints to the amount of time anything has to wait for a response. So we want to know, how does the OS actually implement these features? So there are our three B views, application, system, and implementation. All right, some more definitions. So a long, long time ago, people didn't really call operating systems operating systems. They were called master control program, MCP. And in fact, there is an operating system out there that's actually called MCP. It's from Burroughs. Um, we'll talk about that another day. Um, but people kind of moved away from that terminology because they thought it sounded a little too harsh and they moved towards the term operating system. Now, 
we're not going to deal so much with an operating system as a whole. The part of an operating system that we're going to be dealing with the most is the kernel. And the kernel is what I say stands between the user and the hardware. It's going to do a bunch of things for the user program, and it's going to do a bunch of things for the hardware. And the operating system as a whole is the kernel and all of the related programs and services offered. Things like task managers, disk defrag tools, uh, bash shell prompts, um, maybe programming libraries, all of those things are part of the OS as a whole. Some more definitions. So there are different kinds of kernels for the operating system. There's what's known as a monolithic kernel. And probably, I'm going to guess for 99.99% .99 of you out there, you've been using a monolithic kernel operating system. We say this is everything in the kitchen sink. It means if it could go in the kernel, we're going to put it in the kernel. So the desktop environment, that's in the kernel. Yeah, everything. Now, this could also mean device drivers, virtual memory, inter-process communication, everything is in the kernel. And that's how you end up with the operating systems whose kernel installs are like multi gigabytes in size. They're massive. Every device driver in the world inside the kernel. By the way, operating systems, things like Linux and Windows, the number of billions of lines of code that they are is, is immense. And you might be thinking, wow, that's a lot of code. Are operating systems really that big? And the answer is actually no, they're not. The reason why Windows and the reason why Linux are so many hundreds and millions of lines of code is actually because of how many drivers are included. They support drivers for things like Dvorak keyboards. Linux has drivers for hardware that nobody's used in the last 20 years. And you might be wondering, why are they still including the code for those drivers with the Linux operating system, Linux kernel? Well, because there's going to be one company out there that still uses that hardware and you want to make sure that you're still offering support for it. So, yeah, the actual number of lines of the Linux kernel that are truly the kernel implementation is much less than the number of lines when you download it. Fun story. Now, what's a microkernel? A microkernel is the opposite of a monolithic kernel. We're going to put all the bare minimum of things into the kernel's implementation. And it's actually really funny how little needs to be in the kernel. Um, QNX, for example, is a microkernel operating system. And it's amazing the things that are not in the kernel. If memory serves me, even things like device drivers, which are traditionally in the kernel, for good reasons, not in the kernel. Um, things like virtual memory, not in the kernel. They're all running as user programs. And what that means is that the kernel is tiny and compact. And why you'd want to have a microkernel operating system is it gives you the ability to actually run the OS embedded in hardware, which is kind of a really neat thing to do. Then we have this special special designation of a real-time OS, which QNX, by the way, is also a real-time operating system. Now, what this means is that if we're saying an OS is real-time, we are saying that there, the response times to events um, is very clearly dictated. And here's an example of what we mean by that. Do you want Microsoft Windows to drive your car? Or do you want QNX to drive your car? If I had to choose, I'm going to choose QNX. And here's why. I need to guarantee that if somebody walks in front of my car, steps out into the road, I need to guarantee that the second, not even the second, the microsecond, that the camera picks up that there is an obstacle in front of a car. I need the car to respond immediately and throw the brakes on. The delay between detecting the obstacle and responding to the detected obstacle has to be absolutely instantaneous. That there can't be a delay. An operating system like Windows is not real time. It's not a real time OS. There could be a delay there. 
I don't want there to be a delay in a self-driving car. So these are the kind of use cases for real-time OSs. We are making very stringent guarantees about how long it takes to respond to an event happening. Things like Windows and Linux, though, not traditionally considered real-time OS. There could be a delay. For a human, just sitting at your computer, those delays aren't a big deal. But if you're a self-driving car, they're a big deal. All right. So I said that the kernel of an operating system is what stands between the hardware and the user. And this is kind of a diagram to show that. And what you can see here is we have the kernel kind of isolated from those two things. So the kernel is the only thing that is permitted to actually access hardware directly. So it's the only thing that's actually permitted to talk to hardware directly. Um, and we're going to go into detail about that more in about a month's time. Um, we'll do a little bit of that today, just so you understand why. Uh, so only we only let the kernel interact with hardware directly. And then we have the user programs. If they want to interact with the hardware, they have to go through the kernel. And for the kernel to re send responses back from hardware uh, to the user programs, that's how things are going to go. So when I say the kernel stands between the hardware and the user, this is what I mean. Now, why have we abstracted the hardware away from the user programs? If I want to communicate with my video cards, wouldn't I want the user program to directly interact with that? Yeah, kind of. That's nice performance wise. But if we did that, if we let user programs directly interact with hardware, what if I buy a new video card? If I buy a new video card, let's say I have um, Unreal Tournament, the first one, one of my all time favorite games, or I have Red Alert 2, another one of my all time favorite games. And let's say that I have the version that was built for my Riva TNT2 graphics card that I had back in the day. And let's say I upgraded it. And when I upgraded it to a GeForce, the game would stop working if I was allowing the game to directly communicate with the graphics card. Why would it stop working? Well, because it's a different piece of hardware and how we interact with it would be different than the other piece of hardware. So every time I change a piece of hardware, I would have to get a patch or a new version of the game in order to actually interact, to have that game run. So what we actually do is we abstract the hardware. So each time we change our hardware out, we don't have to have a new version of the game or the user program. And this is also true for things like patches. When you patch the Windows kernel, which is like every week, you don't have to buy a new copy of Unreal. Not that anyone buys Unreal 1 anymore, but you don't have to buy it because it just works because the user programs aren't directly interacting with the hardware. The kernel abstracts that interaction very useful thing. And yes, to the person on Twitch, Red Alert 2 and Unreal Tournament are epic and great. I have sunk way more hours into Red Alert 2 than I will ever admit to. And I have had games that have lasted over 16 hours. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I haven't acquired the um, remake. <laughs> All right, so you notice that I keep mentioning the word abstraction because that is one of the major things that a kernel of an operating system does. It abstracts things. And what is it abstracting for you? Well, files in file systems are an abstraction. You might think of files as being a very low level concept, but they're not. Files are an abstraction of secondary storage and how individual bits are actually stored in the permanent storage device. And in the kernel of the operating system is abstracting all of that and presenting it to the execution environment, to the user program, to you as open, write, and close. Address spaces, again, something you might think is a very low level concept. It's an abstraction. It's an abstraction provided by the kernel of how memory is actually implemented and used. Here's a little challenge for you. Go home tonight. I guess you're already home. <laughs> Write a program. Have that 
program spit out the address of main, a global variable, a global constant, some stuff on the heap, and a local variable. Open that program at the same time and keep it open. Open like 50 copies of it. What do you see that's interesting about those addresses? Proof that the kernel is abstracting how physical memory actually works. We will, by the way, do this experiment when we talk about virtual memory, but if you're bored, there's something to do. Processes and threads, even that is an abstraction of how the program is actually being executed. Things like sockets for networking, that's an abstraction. Pipes, it's an abstraction. Your operating is system, your kernel is abstracting the actual implementation details. It's abstracting the hardware for the user programs and for the users. And there are two really good reasons to do this. One really good reason to abstract these things is to create, is good design. It's a good design principle. Because when I download the Windows update, I don't want my software to be broken. The Windows update should have absolutely no negative impact on all of the programs that I have running right now. And it can. Updates can have negative impacts. For example, so if you're a Mac user, you might know that Apple doesn't actually give you NTFS write support by default. There are hacks that you can do to enable it, but if you want NTFS write support, you have to purchase a driver to do this. It's about $35 is the student price. It's really expensive, actually. Now, here's the thing. If you do an update, it's entirely likely that that NTFS driver that you bought stops working. The updates in some operating systems will actually destroy your program. For example, when I upgraded from High Sierra to Catalina, and I did this, I think it was last term. No, it wasn't last term. I think it was last fall. <laughs> Whenever Catalina came out. Apple removed some functionality. The removal of some functionality meant some of my programs that I use on a daily basis no longer function. You want to make sure that your operating system has abstracted in, been abstracted in such a way such that user programs during updates are never affected. You want to make sure that when people replace hardware, it doesn't affect the user program. Abstraction is a good design decision for an operating system. Another reason why abstraction is so important is due to security. I don't want a user program to be able to access the bits directly on my drive. Because if a user program, if any user program can directly access the bits on a disk, then it can bypass the permissions and it can steal anything it wants. It can get my password file. There's no point in passwords at that point. So abstraction is really good for both design, but it's also really good for security. And it's really good for developers too, because you never have to worry about what the hardware is underneath. And to the Twitch person saying, RIP to 32-bit gaming, yeah, that's what bit me in the ass. My uh, Stereo 3D program, it's the standard 3D program for working with 3D images, was 32-bit. I didn't actually know it was 32-bit. I don't care. Do an upgrade to Catalina. Stops working. Yeah, that sucked. <laughs> All right. So what are we going to cover in this course? Uh, introduction. You are done. Uh, we're going to start in our next episode by talking about threads and concurrency. And then we move on to the topic of synchronization, which is we're giving you all these lovely threads to deal with, but oops, you've got to use them properly. So let's fix that with synchronization. Then we'll talk about things like processes in the kernel. So how do pro you actually create the execution environments and how do you um, isolate the kernel from the user programs. Then we have the big topic of the course, which is virtual memory which is abstracting the address space and actually providing the true isolation between processes. There's scheduling, which is how do you choose which program gets to use the CPU next. Uh, devices and device management, that's talking about how do you interact with a device, how do you write a device driver. We'll also go into detail here about how secondary storage works. So how does a hard drive work? How does an SSD work? 
Then we'll talk about file systems, which is how do you actually um, store data on the disk. And that's actually an interesting topic because it's not just about how do you store it on the disk, but you have to store it in such a way that you can find it later. And then we're going to wrap up the whole end of the course by talking about virtual machines, which will review all of these topics and we'll probably have time left over at the end. And we may talk about networking and how do you design an OS. It really depends on how things go. Now, for those of you who are wondering, are we going to have a guest speaker this term? I am trying to acquire one. The people who I am trying to acquire are hard to get a hold of. We were very lucky last term. We got Brian Kernahan uh, to do uh, an interview with the students. Um, of course, this is on, on YouTube and you're welcome to watch it. I will continue to try to get us a very nice guest speaker, but I cannot make any promises, unfortunately. If you have any ideas, send me a name and I will try to contact them. And I know you're probably going to say Linus and Bill Gates. I've already tried. <laughs> I don't think they respond to emails from strangers. <laughs> I have met Linus years ago, but um, yeah, that was like 13 years ago. All right. So as I said, in our next episode, we are going to talk about threads. So we will see you then. Hello, I'm a Mac. Mac has issued a salutation, cancel or allow. Allow, and I'm a PC. You're returning Mac salutation, cancel or allow? Allow. Okay, why gives? Mac is asking a question, cancel or allow? Allow. He's part of Vista, my new operating system. PCs have a lot of security problems, so he asked me to authorize pretty much anything I do. You're pointing out Vista's flaws, cancel or allow? Allow. I could turn him off, but then he wouldn't give me any warnings at all, and that would defeat the purpose, so. You are coming to a sad realization, cancel or allow? Allow.